Hello, everyone. This is the webinar for Wonder Indosoft Web Studio about the OPC UA as a solution for industrial Internet of Things. A quick look here on the agenda that we're going to be presenting today. My name is Andre Bastos. I'm the R&D and QA manager for Indosoft. I'm going to start with a quick introduction about the product in the Soft Web Studio, talk a little bit about IoT and in the soft solution for the IoT world, our runtime called IoT View. We're going to talk about OPC UA and that's when we're going to bring our very special guest, Mr. Jim Luth from Schneider Electric and also the CTO for the OPC Foundation. Ed is going to do a presentation from the OPC Foundation focusing on OPC UA. So, brief introduction about Indusoft. Our product, Indusoft Web Studio, is a tool that you can use to design your projects, to configure screens, to configure communication with field devices, acquire data from the field, store this data in historians, in databases, and then present this data in any form that you may need. So, you can present on your computer as a local viewer, you can present remotely as a remote secure viewer, or also in any HTML5 ready uh, browser. So when you need to change data with other devices and you need connectivity, Indosoft Web Studio offers several options among them, built-in communication drivers as well as OPC. The product is based on an open architecture having as the three main focus portability, mobility, and interoperability. So portability, you design your product, your project using Indosoft Web Studio, and you can deploy that project on a Windows 10 computer or on a Windows embedded runtime that can be Windows embedded standard or even Windows embedded compact, formerly Windows CE. And uh, since version 8, we also run on Linux. That's our runtime IoT view. Mobility, to have access to the data that you are collecting, the data that you need to visualize, you can do that by a local viewer, so the traditional touchscreen HMI computers uh, where you have the, uh, the whole project running and you can control from there, or you can do that remotely. Here we are showing a couple of tablets and uh, mobile devices, and you can do those in any of this operating system, as long as you have one browser that is HTML5 enabled. Interoperability. If you are an HMI software, you must have connectivity. You must be able to call, connect the devices on the field, get the data, and in the soft offers hundreds of built-in communication drivers, offers all the flavors that you may need from OPC, and offer even specific protocols, such as SNMP or MQTT, the cloud cloud friendly and QTT as well. With this, we can focus on letting our user develop projects focusing on productivity. Having a product running for over 20 years can show the reliability that you can have in our products and security as our main focus. Now, nowadays, we have cybersecurity, we have threats, we have uh, danger out there, and Indusoft is committed to always work on our best to make sure and guarantee that our users are protected when they use our products as well. A little bit about our internal architecture. So, the way the product works, you have a main PEX engine and several tasks running independently, where the PEX engine is the one that connects all these tasks. For instance, we have our OPC client. I'm going to use my OPC to communicate with a server, get the data, and how I'm going to present this data to the screen. I'm going to send this data to the tags engine. Then the tags engine is going to propagate the value of the tag. In this case, it's going to go to the TCP IP server, and from there, it's going to go, for instance, to the viewer or to a remote thin client. Uh, could be a, our mobile access solution, but mainly, the core of the product is the tags engine. A 
the next slide where we show a little bit about our connectivity. So we could spend our entire webinar only talking about all the options that you have with our product in the Soft Web Studio. So we're going to start down here with over 240 communication drivers. We have a legacy communication drivers to talk to devices that are not even available anymore on the market. But we have also everything that is new is there. So we have drivers for all the Schneider Electric PLCs and runtimes. We have for Omron, GE Fanuc, anything that is on the market out there. You, can, you name it. So if you want to talk uh, with Backoff, we have a driver for it. We want to communicate with uh, Modbus. Yes, Modbus PCP, Modbus Plus, anything that you may need, we have built in as part of the product. It's not an extra or nothing like that. If we don't have, but you have a protocol and you have uh, C++ skills, you can write your own communication driver using our toolkits. Or if you want to write your own project, let's say using C++, you can use, or even C Sharp, you can use our toolkits to write your own program and have access to our text database using our APIs. We have built-in XML interfaces, ADO to talk to any relational databases, OPC server, DA, and coming soon on our next release, we're going to have also the OPC EUA server for all of our platforms, uh, for Windows and for IoT view as well, no Windows CE on this release. We have our web connectivity, HTML5. And finally, we reach the OPC client. Web Studio, since the version 7, has OPC UA client, uh, formerly XI, now OPC.net. We have OPC XML, DA, and the old OPC class, all part of the InSoft solution. InSoft has been uh, uh, adopting OPC since, uh, I think, 1999. Even on Windows CE, we've been having that product. We've been a member of the OPC Foundation for quite some time. We attend all of their inter, uh, interoperability workshops. We really believe that that's the ideal solution. As we're going to see during James' presentations, why OPC really came to solve several problems that software like ours used to have. Portability. The main thing about in Software Web Studio is that you have only one development environment that you use to create your screens, to create your configuration, and then you can deploy on any size of runtimes. That means you can run on a Windows full runtime, it can be a Windows server, it can be a Windows 10 station, or you use the same project to a smaller runtime, basically running on Windows embedded. The next uh, generation is called the Windows IoT Enterprise. We do that, and also Windows Embedded Standard 8 and 8.1, 8.1 Industry. Uh, we had a runtime for all of them. As you go to Windows Embedded Compact, we have a runtime CE view running on uh, Windows Compact 7, even Windows CE 6. You still run there, and you use the same develop environment to develop the project. So you just decide where you're going to deploy it. And the latest one, IoT view. We have here a picture of someone holding uh, a Raspberry Pi. I'm going to show that how to do that. So you can develop a project web studio and actually deploy to a Linux-based runtime. In this case, we are showing a Raspberry Pi, for instance. So from a big server SCADA, you know, millions of points, to small IoT devices, you got the solution all using Indusoft Web Studio. And how are you going to have access to this data? How are you going to visualize this data? So. You can either do locally on the local viewer, but as we go to the mobility aspect of this, we have the thin clients. So the first thin client solution that we ever came with was based on ActiveX, where you had to use Internet Explorer. We installed our plugin on it, and then you have access to the full project from a browser. So the project can be running on this computer here, and you can use the browser remotely anywhere to access. So it's not a remote desktop thing. Uh, you can have screens and values running in one screen and a completely different screen and uh, processing on the browser. Similar to this web thing client, we have our secure viewers, what's, what is basically our visualization module that you can access remotely. So you tell where the server is or servers, because that's, uh, that has a redundancy built in on it. We open the viewer, authenticate, get the files that we need, and you can see the screen, you can control your project as if the project was running on the same computer. And the evolution of all that is our Studio Mobile Access, SMA, thin clients. 
the beauty of this is that this platform is agnostic. All you need is a web browser that supports HTML5, the latest technology for that, and all based on HTML5 and JavaScript, where, again, you can access all the screens, you can access anything using a browser. So you can run your runtime in a small device and see everything that's happening on the browser. Is this IoT, right, or what? So talking a little bit about IoT, just a couple of concepts here. IoT, which means Internet of Things, is basically used to describe the practice of connecting any device through the Internet. You have a device connected to the Internet, that's an IoT-capable device. And the IoT is already connecting computing devices, uh, appliances, and humans, and even other living beings through the Internet. When we talk about you know, having chips uh, in, in dogs and things like that that you know, could potentially send data directly, you know, so the IoT is made of events and signals. It has to be optimized from all different kinds. So that would require a standard, a standardized mode of communication. That's where we're going to see how OPC EUA comes into play. Talking about the industrial Ethernet of Things and Schneider offerings. Industrial Ethernet of Things delivers a huge potential for industrial companies. For anything that you have to have access to production, to state, to alarms, through the internet. We're talking about enabling machines, enabling some components to be industrial internet of things, okay? So our IIoT, Schneider Globally Technologies, make industrial operations much safer, more reliable, efficient, profitable, and sustainable. When you see the, uh, the prospect for IoT, the data that, that we got here from uh, Wind River, Helix 360 system tools, we have here the potential fifth-fold growth in stored data by 2020. We're talking about everything being stored. We're not talking about big data anymore. It's huge data. And right now, 85% of the devices are not connecting yet, but eventually they may be connected. So there is out there $19 trillion estimated in opportunity. Platforms where IoT is being developed. Windows C and Windows Embedded, that's still out there on the market. Those has a very strong position on industrial HMIs. That works. It's very good for proprietary systems. It, right now it's about 40% of traditional uh, real-time operating system shipments. And Linux, over 25% of all embedded, and will be even more if we would consider Android, which is based on Linux as well. And here comes the Indosoft solution for it, in the soft IoT view. That's our runtime that we have developed and released a couple of years ago, where it's platform agnostic, so it doesn't depend on Windows anymore. You can run that on Linux. It's a very small footprint, interoperability. It has communications with devices, specific communication drivers, has MQTT, Modbus, and also OPC UA clients, and coming soon, OPC UA server as well. Mobility, our Runtime for IoT, our IoT view, can export data and you can access this data using any HTML5 ready browser and it's very affordable because our business model is based on high volume. Just a few examples of commercial IoT devices. We have, for instance, the uh, area scale from Fitbit. We have the Nest uh, thermostat, the Nest cameras. So we have a device and you access the information this device is generating through the web on a cloud application. So this device is feeding the cloud with information, right? So think about that, apply it on the industrial road. Let's take a look on Indosoft IoT view solution. Traditional way that you have, you will have an HMI talking to the PLC and bring this data up to a cloud or to a in-house server. So we had to be connected, we had to have uh, the protocol communication for the PLC, that's the traditional way to, uh, that we had to approach to the market. Okay, the cloud or the in-house server is going to still be there. But let's talk about sending this data wirelessly now from all these devices here, right? So we could connect to all these devices with our own time running on a real-time operating system like Linux or VxWorks. So IoT View can talk to all the devices, grab this data, 
push this data up to a cloud or in-house server. This is ready. This is the best tool that you can have to have an IIoT ready system using our IoT View solution. IoT View is platform agnostic. Again, it runs uh, on Linux, for instance. It's not based on Windows only. Very, very small footprint for interoperability. It offers, we're going to see on the next screen, some of the industrial protocols plus OPC UA. And for mobility, you can access everything that is being processed there through any HTML5 ready browser. Could be iOS, could be Android. So, and here are the features that IoT View has right now, ready to go to the market as you get out of the box. And one of them is the OPC UA client on the top of some traditional drivers that you would have. Portability, you develop for Windows, you can download on Linux with all those functions that you can do. So you can do processing, you can uh, get the data, execute all these functions using our built-in functions, and everything works on IoT View as well. So we got hundreds of built-in functions that you can use there. Benefits from a thing, as we're going to see, could be a simple Raspberry Pi computer to the big data. We get the information, we push it up. This is going to lower your total cost of ownership, going to reduce the time to market from your project. It has a very small footprint. It's very easy to collect the data. We make it in a way that you don't have to be a programmer. You're just going to configure and going to get things done. And functionality. Everything that was working on HMI, we are making it work on IoT View as well. Quick introduction now about OPC UA before I hand it over to our very special guest. So he's going to talk with more details about the foundation and about OPC UA. The only reason why I brought this up is because I'm going to show a demo here of Indusoft running on Linux. And that's the nice thing about it. OPC UA is platform independent. It incorporates all the OPC uh, specifications. It's secure, as you're going to see. On that suit, it supports encryption, authentication, and certificates, and it is extensible. So the way it has been built, you can add new features without breaking anything that's working today. In a quick summary of the functionalities, you have discovery where you can find servers out there. You have the concept of address space based on files and folders on demand. So you can read and write as needed or by subscription. You subscribe to a uh, an item, and whenever that item changes, you receive the information. It supports alarm and events, and support even methods. Think about this. From my OPC UA client, I can call a method from a server. I can call a function block from my PLC. That's you know that, that, that's a dream from for any system integrator, and this is happening now. And yeah, but for independent, you're not based on Windows only. The way originally OPC was. Uh, uh, was created was to run on Windows with uh, DCOM. So let's take a look now on a quick demo using Indusoft Web Studio. So I'm going to bring here our development environment. Let me show what we've got here. So on this other computer, we have a backup TwinCat 3 running with OPC enabled. Here are some of the OPC modes that we talked about. So we had uh, user identity, we would uh, make it require user and password, for instance. I configure a server port, uh, endpoints. So here we have some of the variables on the PLC. We can see some are dynamically changing values. Others are static, where you can read and write to these tags. And here on Indusoft Web Studio, I have developed a project with you know just a simple screen, nothing fancy, with a couple of tags. And these tags, they are actually connecting through OPC UA. So here is the IP address and the port number of this OPC UA server. Okay, so here's the IP address. That's where my TwinCat is running. Okay, and uh, we saw the port is 4848. So a quick connection test here. And this reaching there and succeeded, which means that this OPC UA server is reachable. Configuring the communication, you use on Web Studio the tags anywhere you want. 
And then you can configure worksheets where you choose the connection that we have just created. The connection supports all the security parts, so you could choose security modes, security policies. For instance, if I select here security modes, and ask me if I want to create a self-signed certificate. Here we can choose different uh, policies, great trust list. I can trust a server certificate that shows all the security that is embedded on the OPC way specification and beautiful things like we can browse the items from the OPC server that is on the other side. So we are reaching the server now, uh, building here the list and here are the tags that are on the server. And I select a tag, we even can get what the current value there. I click again, see it has updated. So we have created this project and where am I gonna download this project? I'm gonna connect to this IP address here and this IP address is this runtime IoT view running on Linux. So that's this fella here. You can see on the menu here, this is a Raspberry Pi running Linux and this is the one that's gonna receive our runtime our project now, which was configured to communicate OPC UA with that TwinCat. So I go on my project here. I have already downloaded, so I'm going to just click Run from here. So I'm going to go here on my device, and here shows on the log that it's, uh, it's preparing to connect to the server TwinCat. And here's going to be my runtime running on Linux. What if I want to see the data that is in there? Okay, so I can use any HTML5 ready uh, browsers. I could use here on my computer, connecting to it there. Or if I want to locally, what I can do here, I can call a browser. So in this browser, I'm going to enter this URL. You're going to ask me to enter a user and a password. I have developed only one screen, this one called main. So we're going to go to the main screen here. And here's the data that we can compare with the data from TwinCat. So here's the TwinCat runtime. And here's our IoT view. So this guy here that has four, five, six, we can see on the left. I'm going to change it to, let's say, uh, seven, eight, nine. I hit enter, and we have 789 here on TwinCat. Okay, I can do it the other way around. So I'm going to do here 987, and I'm going to write this value. There we go. I look here, and I got 987 on my browser. So I'm acquiring this data through OPC UA on my runtime running on this little in a very inexpensive Raspberry Pi, okay? And coming soon on our next version, we're going to have also OPC UA server on IoT View. So we're going to be able to push this data out through OPC as well, okay? So right now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to pause, and I'm going to invite our very special guest, Mr. Uh, James Luth. Uh, Jim, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. All right. So I just stopped sharing. And uh, Jim, I'm going to uh, introduce you as a fellow uh, Shutter Electric employee. Uh, you are mm -hmm. also the CTO of the OPC Foundation. And he's right. going to bring us here some uh, a very nice presentation about the OPC Foundation and all the progress that were made throughout this year to enable connectivity for uh, all of us that work on the industry fields and expand it to much more than that. Welcome, Jim. So, hello, everyone. Uh, as, as I was introduced, I, I am Jim Luth, not Tom Burke. If you were hoping to hear from Tom Burke, the president of the OPC Foundation, unfortunately, he had a conflict this afternoon and was unable to do this session of the webinar. Uh, but I told him I would run through his slides and uh, do the best I could to explain the material 
Uh, as a background, I am the CTO of the OPC Foundation. I've been involved in OPC since about 1997. Um, I chair the OPC UA Working Group and have been uh, heading that the effort of bringing OPC UA to the world uh, since the beginning of OPC UA in 2003. So hopefully I'll know the material okay. Um, a couple of things, you know, just about the foundation. The, the, the foundation's job is to is to run a consortia of companies and end users uh, for the purpose of having a a interoperable multi-vendor uh, communication platform and information modeling platform specifically for industrial automation and and this is a, a relatively broad but narrow enough focus uh, that we're able to uh, essentially take OPC, now OPC UA, and apply it in, in many different levels and areas in, in the automation market. Um, the, the, the consortia has been around since uh, 1995, I believe. It's run by, uh, organized as most consortia are with the board of directors. Uh, you can see here that it's, um, the, the, the people in control here are large, um, automation vendors mostly, um, and interesting to point out though, two of our members are are in the IT and uh, higher level in information technology area, SAP and Microsoft, and uh, they play a key role in in sort of some of the higher level directions uh, that we have as we as you go up the food chain away from uh, low level control up, up through ERP and, and uh, IT systems. So the, the the foundation, of course, at this point is very much an international uh, organization. Uh, we have we have offices in in the U.S., Japan, um, and uh, Europe, Germany. The the, uh, the concept, though, of being truly an, an international organization uh, is is happening more and more. Uh, currently, about 50% of our our members are in Europe. 28% uh, in North America, and then the rest of the world. You can see how it's split. China is is undergoing uh, some rapid growth. You see, they they already uh, account for 9% of our members. There's a lot of uh, interest in OPC UA um, in all all over the world at this point and growing. So, as a history of of what it is that um, that, that OPC set out to solve, and this goes back again to 1995, um, at that time, uh, companies like Indusoft, like Wonderwear, like Iconics, and, and others uh, were, were building uh, software products, HMIs, uh, high-level Windows-based control systems and things like that, um, but not hardware. And, and those companies um, effect effectively worked to, to create drivers to talk to every known piece of industrial automation equipment that existed. And the companies like that would spend literally more than 50% of their R&D dollars doing nothing more than writing drivers. And what OPC tried to set out to do in a, in a simple way, specifically on the Windows platform, was to create a model where um, a, a driver would be created by one Company, ideally the hardware company was producing the hardware, um, but but at least there being a sort of a separate market for these what, what ultimately were OPC servers, and then applications that needed data from those pieces of hardware could simply talk to to that OPC server to the device. So this is similar to the to the printer model on Windows, where you typically get a a Windows printer driver that comes with the printer, and then any application on Windows can talk to that printer. So we were the we were the organization that created a practical um, model for this kind of a driver. What we ended up being the OPC server. Now again, back then this was all Windows only and based on COM and DCOM, and that proved to be an effective way to do what we needed to do and to do it quickly, which uh, led to our success. Um, but it also uh, gave us a, a challenge when, when uh, the technology, and in particular the common DCOM technology, 
evolve to other things. So over time, um, we needed to move our standards um, ahead and, and in a sense, we, we had done a lot of work um, first on data access and then we created common interfaces for historical data, get data access and then more interfaces for alarms and conditions and then we branched into XML and did XML DA and then we added um, PLC to PLC communication with data exchange and security and batch and so forth. And in the end, we realized we were creating a bunch of um, unique uh, and separate standards that each had to be implemented and tested completely from the ground up each time. And, and we didn't have a lot of reusability. Um, and so in the end, um, we decided that as we went forward um, that we would, uh, we would do things a, a bit differently. So when we designed OPC UA, um, we, we essentially took a fresh look at, at how we were going to do things um, and, and what we were going to improve on. So we, 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 we attempted to improve in, in many, many different ways from the OPC Classic stuff. So a couple of things that we did was we wanted to, of course, preserve the technology we had to develop, had already developed that was successful, but namely the DA interface and to some extent alarms and events and historical interface and so forth. But we wanted to provide platform independence, um, so we didn't want to pin our technology to a Microsoft-only uh, implementation. And we wanted to, um, this time, also uh, address directly the security aspects. And as you can imagine, uh, back then it was quite unusual, this goes back to 2003, to actually take on security at, at this kind of a interface level, but we did and uh, it's proved to be very important in OPC UA that we did that. So we wanted to have something that would be compatible through wrappers and, and proxies with the existing classic stuff. We wanted to keep the performance high as we had uh, good performance with the DCOM technology, provide more technology, more diagnostics, be easy to use, get rid of DCOM and, and its underpinnings. And so we did all that. Um, and it became known as the unified architecture. Um, and so we, we created a model at a high level to build the functionality, uh, the specific functionality of DA and HDA and alarms and events, but we tied it this time to lower level technologies like TCP IP and OpenSSL, which gave us the portability we needed. And then we used state-of-the-art uh, security uh, concepts, algorithms, libraries, um, to do all of our uh, cryptographic and security stuff. And that fundamentally is what, what today makes up the unified architecture. So in a, in a diagram, um, you can see how, uh, how UA is built. Um, and the specifications themselves are, are layered in a way that's similar to this model. Um, on the bottom, from bottom to top here, we have um, a set of data models or a meta, what we call a meta model, which explains how to describe data in UA terms um, and as a, as a concept thing. And then uh, at the lowest transport level, we have um, the, the protocols, TCP IP, web sockets, um, and, and the encodings, binary XML, JSON, and, and so forth that we have today. On top of that, we, we have a, a set of base services, and by that it's, it's getting into, into the services that are called over the wire. Think about web services. If you have a SOAP web service, you make a, a method call and you pass a few things and you get a few things back. Well, these base services in UA are things like read, write, discover, um, subscribe, things like that to do fundamental operations. So where we talk about the, 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 the how, I, as the I'm going to read something or I'm going to write something, but we don't talk about what you're reading or writing. The what is, comes in the, in the higher level information models. So we have the what described by the equivalent of our DA. So there you're reading and writing real time data, you know, valid, value quality and timestamp stuff. And alarms and conditions were, were reading and writing and subscribing to event notifications and the event notifications may, may correspond to uh, state changes in an in, in alarm uh, uh, model, as an example. 
in historical access we're reading and writing and subscribing to uh, not current data but but data that's been stored in, in a historical database of some format and then programs as a whole another uh, layer of, of functionality that we have is built on top of state machines to provide uh, states of long-running processes or systems. So those are the OPC information models that we all have, uh, and, and they're all in, in their own separate specifications, again, layered away from the details of the lower-level pieces. And then on top of that, uh, we have a, the, the functionality that we built our information models on, of course, is available to other organizations, and many organizations have built information models on top of UA, uh, ISA 95, um, EDDL, uh, built uh, FDI on top of OPC UA, and so forth. There, there are many organizations, and we'll talk, see that some, in some later slides. And then, of course, every vendor who creates a product um, has their own information that is inherent in their in their in their product, right? So if you look at the Indusoft engine, you'll find certain variables and certain things that they'll expose um, in their UA server that's going to be different than 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 the Wonderware server or somebody else's server. Um, and again, all of that stuff layers on top of all these base services in a way that they can provide their own information model without violating the spec and uh, without watering down what is the information that they provide. So, the, the, um, in the case of um, OPC UA, um, what we did was it, we, we combined and utilized these same set of base services. So, instead of having a DA write and a DA read and an AE write and an AE read and so forth, we now have a, a single service um, that can do all of that. And so, if you built DA and you wanted to add HDA, all you have to do is add the information model. So all of the compliance testing, all of the interoperability testing, all of the security handshaking, all of the stuff that would go into building um, these other functionalities in at the lower level is already taken care of. Once you have it, you have it, and you can build everything else on top of it. So it provides a much better path for, for increased functionality over time. So. Um, Again, as we said, the, the, a number of organizations now uh, create specifications that, that describe a specific information model for a specific use. Um, some examples, PLC Open describes the function blocks that you create in an 1131 environment for, for uh, control. Uh, MT Connect is an organization that is specifying um, machine tool industry Equipment and pro and processes and systems uh, with you know spinning spindles and metting cutting cutting tools and three axis motion uh, information and so forth. Um, Auto ID is is a, a standard that describes the information model for RFID readers in, in an automation world and so forth. Automation ML is is about um, automating and, and describing control systems through uh, through a XML language. So all of these things have a very narrow uh, niche of, of functionality and, and uh, applicability. Uh, and each of these, though, they, they have to have a way to convey a lot of that information uh, and exchange it at runtime with, with automation systems. And each of these organizations has chosen to, to map their uh, fundamental information model in terms of a OPC UA companion spec and build it on top of OPC UA, take advantage of all of the lower level pieces uh, that the foundation actually provides. Um, and then again, you can build uh, on top of that with, um, with vendor specific things. Um, and again, you're taking advantage of all the base services and, and the base protocols and none of that ever has to change. And then you're adding your own vendor specific um, structures and methods and anything else that you might need. And all this is discoverable um, through the client API. And, and so this is a, a key part of the, the beauty of, of the, the lack of brittleness and the connection of OPC clients and servers. If I take a client that was written five years ago that knows nothing about some vendor specific method call that, that um, Indusoft invented last week, and I connect that client to this new server that's never seen before, it can discover 
everything about that method call, what the parameters are, what the structure of the parameters are, what the, what the function does, and so forth. And a, and a, and a reasonable generic client can, can assimilate all that information and provide an interface uh, for that function call without actually having to be rewritten and, and programmed for it. So you have the ability to mix and match products from multiple vendors over, over a large number of years um, and still have uh, the connectivity and the capability of, of new features as they come out without reprogramming them. So the timeless durability is, again, something that we, that we, we talk about. Um, actually, Tom likes to say that I coined that term. Uh, I don't get any money for that, but I think I did. Uh, and, and by that, what, what we're talking about is that we, we uh, purposely built UA to be future-proof. And we've, we've built everything in a way that everything is layered so that bits and pieces can be swapped in and out without disturbing the other, the other pieces. Um, so as an example, um, protocols come and go. Uh, we, we started out, um, as an example, XML was really hot and we did a, a web services binding in the original version of OPC UA. It turns out web services and XML isn't so hot anymore, but now we have things like MQTT and AMQP and JSON and things like that, um, and uh, WebSockets as an example. And so we've added new protocols and new uh, encodings over time. Similarly, uh, as you know, security uh, algorithms get broken. Things that were secure two years ago are no longer secure. And as those things uh, happen, the foundation is able to quickly uh, put in uh, replacements and, and migrate things without touching everything uh, all the way up and down the, the application stack. Um, similarly, we are adding new functionality. Currently, we're working on a pub, a pub sub model. Um, and again, this is a, a, in addition to the request response and subscription model that the foundation already has in OPC UA. So a couple of um, highlights, um, you know, we're all about open data connectivity and providing uh, the right standards to allow vendors to, to connect their products in, in, in all um, variations and all OSs and any place you can build it. Um, the, the data context preservation and, and, the, and the ability to um, adapt to changing systems and systems to grow and add new functionality without recoding everything. Um, everything in UA is expected to be exposed in a natural way. So every system, every application has a sort of a natural data set that's, that's logically already designed in. And, and the, the concept is to expose that exactly the way it is in OPC UA. And we have the complete flexibility to in our information model to describe any relationship, any piece of data, describe any structure of any complexity. And uh, so you don't have to bend your data to fit OPC UA. You, 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 you can bend UA to fit your data is the way it works out. And the last highlight, of course, is data security. Everything we do in OPC UA can and is secure by default. So applications don't talk to each other without security. Uh, users don't get data without providing credentials and so forth, and all of that stuff is specified and done in a standard way uh, that, that makes it easy to, to connect even the multi-vendor systems um, uh, with, with a consistent security model. So, you know, the connectivity, we, we, we have a series of standards, we have a series of protocols for this, and they are ever-changing. Uh, but they are uh, the, 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 we, we strive for interoperability and to minimize the likelihood of, of buying two OPC UA products and not being able to get them to work together. There is always, you know, fringe cases and things like that. But there's a there's a base set of things that has to be there for in all systems to, to try to help with the idea that you can always you can always there's always a way to make it to make it work together. So here again, we're talking about data preservation, where where we we want 
the full fidelity of the system to be exposed and, 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 a, and visible and viable through OPC UA. The, the goal here was, and a lot of systems, especially in the OPC COM days, of course, everybody had their existing native protocols or the way they did things, and then they bolted on things like OPC DA and said, well, you can get at some of the values and some of our system through the OPC interface, but it was always the tack on thing. The goal of OPC UA was to be able to replace all of those things with just OPC UA. And today we see even more and more people doing even things like configuration, uh, video, full streaming video, and all kinds of things through OPC UA as opposed to tacking on other interfaces. So there are pockets where this is actually becoming the case where once you have OPC UA, you don't, you don't have to have five other ways to do the same thing. So the other thing to keep in mind is all of these collaborations, and I talked about the, um, you know, the, the separate information models and what we call the companion specs that go with OPC UA. There's a lot of organizations now that are very much behind uh, the push to, to use OPC UA as a foundation for the things that they need to do. Um, uh, VDMA is a, is a good example of an organization that is that is literally they, they have a dozen teams creating a dozen different companion specs in parallel right now for uh, the, the, the different types of automation uh, specialties and, and things that they that they, uh, they that they specify um, and so this work goes on within these organizations often in conjunction with the foundation or at least with with other OPC UA experts and and some of this stuff comes out at, at amazing rates you know, because again, a lot of this work happens in parallel. On the security note, um, you, there's, there's been a lot of, you know, you see a lot of stuff in the press about systems being hacked and things going wrong. Uh, we've strived right from the beginning to have security experts picking at and poking at OPC UA from a design perspective while it was being designed and now from an operational perspective uh, very recently, um, the German uh, Information Security Office uh, decided that they they wanted to uh, kick the tires on OPC UA in a sense to to find out what the what the possibilities were for a secure protocol for the Industry 4.0 initiative, and uh, th they came away with the conclusion that um, they for for all of the protocols that they looked at, the, the only one that they found that was secure in any way was OPC UA. Um, and, and again, their, their inputs to, to what we did have, have led to um, dozens of, Im of improvements over the security that we already had. So I'm gonna quickly run through these last couple of slides. This again, there's some, some more details about the security and how it works. Um, in OPC UA, that the at the high level, OPC UA relies on a concept called PKI, which is public key infrastructure. This is uh, most people are familiar with this to, uh, to a, at least a little bit of an extent. It's the underpinnings of of the of the uh, internet or the um, the uh, SSL security. Um, and the HTTPS security that you that you're familiar with when you connect your web browser to your bank uh, to do transactions, as an example. So in that case, um, the, the PKI is uh, what they call asymmetric PKI because the, there's a there's a X509 certificate um, that, that secures the the transmission, but the certificate in this case is on one side. The web server has this special certificate. And they can authenticate you, but you can't really authenticate them. Um, in OPC UA, the the, uh, the certificate in X509 PKI is what they call symmetric PKI, and in that case, the clients and the servers both have the certificates, and they mutual do a thing that's called mutual uh, authentication and authorization. And this is a much stronger uh, mechanism because of its symmetric nature than, than what we do today when we do business with our banks. Um, 
So with, with this, uh, with these certificates, uh, we're able to uh, identify and trust the applications themselves, the instance of the application, and then ultimately uh, we go on to the user itself, and the user itself, on top of once applications agree that the applications themselves can speak to each other, uh, we demand the the, the uh, login from the user. And again, here we can use um, username, password, uh, certificates, uh, multi-factor stuff, all that stuff, Kerberos tickets. Um, and now, <clears throat> in the latest re release, OAuth 2 tokens. So th there's a number of success stories that you can read about, um, and I'll, eventually I'll get to a link here for our brochures. Um, but there are uh, there are many uh, examples of of applications and uh, places where uh, OPC UA has been applied to uh, um, to a various number of uh, uh, different types of uh, facilities and, and uh, uses. Um, so because the UA stuff has the security built in and reliability, we didn't talk much about reliability and redundancy, um, but all of that stuff is, is, is baked into the spec, uh, so it can be done in a standardized way. Uh, of course, our communications are not based on, on COM and DCOM anymore, um, and we strive to make um, all of this work in a, in a highly locked down, secure world. Well, looks like our audio was disconnected from from Jim. Uh, let's just see what could be going on. Give me just a minute, folks. Give me just a second here. So I'm sorry, guys. Uh, his audio is out, and of course, his phone is not answering. But as you can see on the slide, we were at the very end of his presentations. We are showing now some of the links for the resource that you have for more information about the OPC Foundation. And finally, we reach his thank you slide. Okay. So uh, I don't know when he's going to realize that. He, he lost his audio. But with this, I'm going to now move into a, a Q&A session. You can submit your questions through our Q&A chat. And I'm going to answer them as I can. So I'm going to make myself a uh, presenter. So the question that I got here is, in a well-configured Web Studio Linux device running OPC UA, is there an acquisition screen similar to what was shown in TwinCat or in a DA server? I'm not sure I understand exactly uh, what you mean with uh, acquisition screen, but uh, back to the concept that we use only one product in the Soft Web Studio to develop the project. And this project you can deploy. So when you use here the Connect, I can deploy this to Linux or I can run the exact same project on Web Studio. So here, using OPC UA, I'm configuring this guy to talk with these tags here that are on the PLC, on the TwinCat PLC, and I could run the very same project here on my Windows computer. So uh, I'm opening now on Windows here. 
and I just realized that I, I'm gonna have to move my screen from uh, one monitor to the other so just bear with me here but yes uh, that's uh, completely possible so I'm gonna configure here my viewer to be able to move from uh, one monitor to the other okay so here I'm running on Windows it's uh, still creating a connection to that uh, twin cat and pretty soon we're gonna start seeing the messages we can even see here the uh, OPC way log information on Web Studio when the communication gets done here we are receiving values now and here you can see these values okay so I hope that's what you mean uh, as you can see the rate here is about every second because this is what we configure here a thousand milliseconds it could be faster we, I could configure that for a faster rate it all depends on what you need to accomplish okay so I hope this I, answers the question I, we my have phone received. got disconnected guys am I did you guys sure. hear any of what I had to say <laughs> we only missed uh, the last three slides so oh, you're oh, doing the God. resources <laughs> and then the thank you slide so uh, okay yeah most of those you could read anyway so yeah what's yeah, the links yeah. on it yeah, all of a all sudden right. I got done and I realized my phone's disconnected, and it's like, I wonder how long I've been talking to no one. Yes, I thank good. everybody <laughs> in your name. That's good. That's good. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay, so uh, we still got here. We still got uh, Jim. We are going now through the uh, Q&A session. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I got here uh, one question that I have just answered, and uh, I'm reading some other ones now. Uh, depending on the question, I'm, I'm answering privately. I did a couple of them. Sure. We got an interesting question here. They asked the difference between MQTT and uh, OPC EUA. They are, you know, uh, MQTT is one specific protocol. You need a broker. You connect to the broker. You push the information. Have subscription uh, with OPC EUA. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. So MQTT, like AMQP, is is a is a broker um, push technology, pub sub, um, and in fact, you can think of MQTT as an equivalent for us. It's it's like a pipe. It's like web sockets or HTTPS or TCP. And uh, in the in the very next release, 1.04, that's that's in release candidate now. Uh, we support AMQP, which is a competing queuing technology, um, and in the follow-on release, we will actually directly support MQTT and OPC UA. Um, so they're not they're they're not equivalents, right? MQTT is a is a pub sub pipe, and OPC UA is a whole infrastructure built on multiple transports. Um, yep. So, so it depends on what you're doing, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, and, and a lot of people, I assume, Indusoft probably supports MQTT directly, um, and a lot of companies do, uh, you know, just to move data uh, between a point A and, and point B. And uh, OPC UA, with the with its information model, is way more than more than just moving the moving the bits over the wire. Yep, yep. I agree. Okay, uh, we are on the top of the hour now. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me show you guys the information about how to contact Indusoft. Here you have uh, our email addresses, you have our web, our websites. If you have any specific question that we were unable to cover here, please feel free to contact us, send us an email. Uh, you have here the numbers in three different countries, US, Brazil, and Germany. And with this, I'd like to thank First of all, our uh, guests here that you know spent this last hour with us, thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to really thank you, Jim, as our very special guest. It was a great presentation. I always love the OPC UA uh, approach and all the news, uh, all the partnerships and all the problems that are being solved with uh, the EUA technology. It really came to solve a lot of problems that sometimes we didn't even know that there could be a solution for them. and. Uh, uh, to all of our uh, attendees, we're going to receive an email with a brief survey. If you feel that survey as a token of appreciation, we're going to send you guys 
one T-shirt from our webinar series. Jim, if you want one, we're going to send uh, one to you as well. And uh, of course, we want to hear about you on that survey, on uh, your honest input, your honest opinion, so we can do better as time goes by. And hope to see you guys again on our next webinar. We have one per month, so you guys uh, are always welcome to join us, okay? So thank you. Thank you, Jim, as well. Thank you. Bye-bye.